the uh, board of directors for inviting me to speak at this year's uh, annual members meeting. Um, so I did this talk with the Utah Audubon Society last spring, and um, I feel like it's an important topic. Um, I know that Utah Native Plant Society is uh, plant oriented, but as um, we have learned, you know, uh, animals and plants and insects and pollinators all are kind of a uh, uh, are part of the same web and important. And so I wanted to discuss uh, uh, the importance of creating urban habitats in cities and towns using native plants. So um, we'll begin here. Uh, so currently uh, we're in the Anthropocene uh, and uh, climate change and is estimated since the 1950s, our wildlife populations have decreased 60% worldwide. Um, we have altered about 70% of the Earth's surface through agriculture, urbanization, resource extraction, and other uh, human uses. Um, right now, the population of the planet is almost 8 billion people and growing, and Utah has reached 3.5 million as of this year. Um, so human-caused issues include uh, aquifer depletion, uh, pollution, climate change, extinction, uh, loss of wetlands, uh, invasive species. Uh, we have numerous uh, human-caused uh, issues that are really impacting the earth. <clears throat> so with climate change uh, upon us um, and, you know, uh, and, and population increasing, uh, the need for water conservation and just conservation in general is imperative. Um, so creating urban habitats in areas that we've already occupied, I think is very important. Um, you know, land is being developed at an exp uh, exponential rate. And particularly here in Utah, um, we've been accustomed to utilizing high water use, uh, using plants, lawns, trees, flowers, and shrubs, which really aren't uh, native here and are on life support. So we need to adopt landscaping practices like that in Arizona where they utilize native plants which are adapted to that uh, landscape. And then we also, in addition, need to create a habitat for wildlife as they have been mis uh, displaced and also restore open space with native plants. So um, native plants versus non-natives. On the left, we have a few native plants and on the right, some of our high uh, water using plants sold at Home Depot and Lowe's and, and commonly used in gardens. So first of all, native plants are well adapted to our climate. They use less water. Uh, they have context in our local environment. Uh, in addition, they're worthy uh, for a place in our landscape just due to their sheer beauty and diversity. Utah has some of the most beautiful plants, I think, in, in my opinion, uh, that should be utilized in the garden. Uh, so the use of non-native plants has resulted in based to species like myrtle spurge, which we are all familiar with along the Wasatch Front. Um, and these can actually destroy entire ecosystems, uh, resulting in monocultures. Uh, pollinators and wildlife have co-evolved with the flora, uh, local flora. So there are many intricate relationships um, that have uh, that exist. And then some plants can only reproduce, uh, you know with a, a single plant species or a genus of, of plant like uh, you know, the monarch butterfly and the Asclepius. Uh, and then some insect species rely heavily on a single plant species to reproduce. Uh, also like the yucca moth uh, that grows with the Joshua trees. Um, you know, the Joshua trees rely on the yucca moth to help pollinate it, but then they offer food to the developing larva. They sacrifice you know, part of their seed load. So five key factors in uh, designing an urban garden. Uh, so we wanna attract wildlife here, that's the goal here. So we wanna first of all, provide food, water, cover, uh, areas to raise young. And then um, we also wanna utilize organic gardening uh, practices. We certainly don't wanna use pesticides, herbicides, things like that around a garden when we're trying to uh, attract animals. So the first, um, a major uh, component of attracting wildlife is providing food. So we want to utilize plants that bloom and produce berries, seeds, nuts, and fruits. Um, so these type of plants benefit pollinators and wildlife. 
So we want to add, uh, also add additional food sources such as bird feeders, suet feeders, hummingbird feeders uh, around the garden, uh, just to kind of boost that uh, attraction. So the plants will provide food by producing seeds, uh, et cetera. And then some plants will actually act as a host uh, for developing young, like our monarch butterfly and Asclepius. Um, the next thing is water. So especially here with this drought, um, water is a very important component of the garden. So um, utilizing bird baths, creating a small pond or riparian area, or adding a shallow bowl of water for ground dwellers. All of these are really important right now as Utah is in a severe drought and wildlife is struggling. Um, cover is another important component. So uh, providing evergreen trees such as pines and firs are great for winter cover. Um, bushes provide cover for uh, ground dwelling species like quail. Um, shrubby perennials, uh, perennials can provide cover for nesting ground species. And then rock piles, logs, um, flower pots can also provide cover for uh, amphibians like toads. So um, wildlife also need places to raise their young. Uh, we can create natural areas that are planted to provide cover, safety, shade, and provide both food and water. So not only do we want to add bird feeders and water features for uh, wildlife, we also want to uh, add you know, bird houses, bee houses and even bat houses. Uh, I have a bat house and um, it's great to watch the bats utilize that. It's kind of a nice thing to add an urban habitat, um, but there are all kinds of little houses and things that you can help, uh, help our uh, wildlife. And then one of the things with creating an organic garden is to keep in mind is we always wanna use organic soil amendments to improve soil. Uh, we can use soil pep, ute lights, and leaf mulch. We want to avoid uh, any chemicals such as herbicides or insecticides. Um, and we want to always employ uh, organic gardening practices. We want to work with nature, not against it. So instead of using uh, you know, uh, herbicides, we want to hand pull weeds, use mulch to inhibit growth. Uh, always use our organic alternatives to pest uh, insects, including manual removing, uh, removal or using native predatory insects. Um, once again, like I said, work with nature instead of against it. Um, watering your garden during dry spells, supplemental watering can be done sparingly, but it can keep the garden, uh, garden looking at its best. Native plants do not require fertilizer, especially if you have good soil. Um, in fact, many native plants will die if you fertilize them. Um, and then also they tend to thrive more on neglect. So they evolved in our high desert uh, environment with temperature and weather extremes, and right now even precipitation extremes. So the type of plants that you may wanna incorporate in the garden include annuals, perennials, uh, grasses, cacti and yucca, shrubs, trees, which include both evergreen and deciduous trees. We kind of want to have a diversity because that will uh, not only create interest in the garden, but give it uh, texture and provide different types of uh, habitats for various uh, types of wildlife. So the first type is annuals. So annuals are actually a great addition to the garden. I feel like they have a, a very uh, good use. Um, for me, I like California poppies. Um, they're easy to grow annual. That blooms in early spring, and then they also do a second bloom in, in fall. Like right now, the uh, second batch started growing, but um, they're great to attract uh, pollinators. They're easy to grow, and they uh, behave well in the garden. They don't take over. Uh, sunflowers are are easy for plant to grow. Uh, they provide not only food for pollinators, but for birds in the fall when their seed pods or their you know their seeds form. So they're, they're just great annuals to use in the garden. So grasses are also an uh, imp uh, important part of the garden. And we have many uh, grasses in Utah that are, are striking and uh, great uh, additions to the garden. So we have Indian rice grass, uh, great basin wild rye. Um, we have grandma grass. All of these not only provide ground cover for wildlife, but they also pr uh, produce seed heads, which uh, can feed birds. And, um, and even their leaves can provide food for uh, insects. 
So perennials are probably uh, one of the big uh, additions to the garden. So perennials are typically plants that live two or more years, um, and then they flower during a particular season. Some have long growing seasons, some have short. Um, so great species to include in your garden are the penstemons, of course. Um, that's one of my favorite. Penstemons are very showy. Um, they are uh, quick growing. They produce these very colorful uh, flower heads. And species that uh, are great to add to the garden include Penstemon sinanthus, the Wasatch Penstemon, uh, Eaton's Penstemon, uh, the Flatleaf Penstemon, Penstemon platophyllus, which grows along Salt Lake County, Penstemon sepalalis. Um, it's a shrubby Penstemon that's long lived, blooms a long time. And then of course, Penstemon palmeri, which is uh, got these huge pink flowers that attract bumblebees and are also very fragrant. Uh, I love the buckwheats, the sulfur buckwheat, uh, the areogonums are great. Um, Asclepias are a great species. We have a few that are great in the garden, which include speciosa, um, you know, the, um, uh, that's the most common one that, the, uh, that people are trying to grow to attract the uh, uh, monarchs. Showy goldeneye is another wonderful species that right now is putting on a show. It uh, blooms in the fall uh, and, really provides a, a great uh, food source for uh, the uh, pollinators. So uh, cacti are also a great addition to the garden. Um, people get afraid of them, but uh, they're uh, in the spring and early summer, they put on quite a display. We have the uh, claret cup cactus, which actually attracts hummingbirds. Um, and then, of course, we have prickly pears, which have these beautiful, um, various colored flowers that attract pollinators. And they also produce seed heads. Uh, some are fleshy fruited, some are dry fruited, which provide food to wildlife. And I also like the yuccas uh, because they just they have these nice flowers and then they kind of they have a nice structure to them that adds interest to the garden. Shrubs are uh, a very important component of an urban garden. Um, so woody plants like, you know, artabesias, uh, some of the rabbit brushes, uh, we have the Mojave sage, salvias, uh, salvia dorii is excellent uh, choice for the garden. Um, they attract pollinators, they provide cover and allow, uh, or some species actually utilize them for nesting. So I'm gonna highlight a few species here that I feel like are very high value uh, for the garden. They, uh, not only pro provide uh, food for pollinators, but they provide an excellent source of food. So uh, elderberry, the Sambuca cerulea is a tall shrub that can grow several feet and it grows, uh, their stems are canes. Um, so they produce uh, flowers pretty, for pretty much all summer um, and produce small edible tart berries in the late summer through autumn. And these are highly utilized by wildlife. Um, and in the garden, these can be cut back every year to reinvigorate them. And they can also be, um, you can take the, the, the new canes from them in uh, early spring and plant them in the garden and, and actually expand the number of plants you have. It's an easy way to, to reproduce. Uh, so yeah, the suckers, sorry. Um, so they can be removed in early spring and planted to produce new growth plants. And, um, one of my favorite things about this is you can also grow these by seeds, but you have to ferment the berries, uh, stick them in a, in a bag and let them kind of rot, and then, then you can plant them out. So the next one is service berries. So the member of the rose family, service berries, uh, we have Utahensis and Alnifolia. Uh, so they produce fragrant white uh, flowers in the spring, uh, very, very um, uh, high value for uh, pollinators. And then they produce apple-like edible berries that are great. Uh, they're kind of tart and dry if you eat them, but they are edible and uh, very useful for wildlife. Very uh, resilient in the garden as well and drought tolerant. So another one of my favorites is of course the uh, golden cur uh, currant Ribes aureum. So these are adapted to both arid and moist conditions. They actually can grow quite uh, out of control in, a, in moist conditions, but they seem to be more shrubby and under control in arid conditions. Um, they produce uh, tons of clove scented flowers in early spring and the berries are edible and you can um, 
actually I've, I've eaten them and I find them, you know, if you add sugar or something, they're pretty good. But I found that um, wildlife species really love them. Um, and, you know, they're great for the garden just because they, um, you know, they're a beautiful uh, plant. One thing with these though, if you don't cut them back, um, they can get kind of lanky and out of control and grow like 10 feet tall. So you wanna uh, kind of keep them under control by cutting them back. So the next component for the garden, of course, is we have the trees. So we have both deciduous and um, evergreen. So as we all know, uh, deciduous trees shed their leaves in winter uh, or fall, I should say. Uh, these include the big tooth maple, uh, Rocky Mountain maple, choke cherry, Gamble's oak and hawthorn. Um, these are common species along the Wasatch Front here and ones that I find are very um, useful in the garden. Many of these do produce flowers, um, seeds, nuts, and fruits. Uh, the oak trees are highly sought out, uh, are highly important along the Wasatch Front because they provide habitat for many bird species and they also produce acorns which are utilized by mammals and birds. Um, and then the other thing I like about it is not only do they add spring and summer interest, they also add autumn interest by producing colorful leaves, uh, which we all uh, love. Yeah, big, of course, the big tooth maple is one of my favorite. It puts on a show right now in, in the, this time of year in the Wasatch Front. Um, and these are great just uh, as a cover for uh, wildlife, but I like to have them just because they are uh, showy in the fall. Choke cherry is a very valuable uh, uh, tree in the garden. Um, it not only produces these huge uh, amount of flowers that are fragrant, uh, uh, these like, if you ever seen one of these choke cherries blooming in the spring, you'll notice how many pollinators are just buzzing around them. You, you, get, you get up next to them and you got pollinators hitting you know, like bees and butterflies. Um, so these bloom early in the spring, and then they produce these uh, cherry uh, cherries actually that are actually edible, but they are kind of <laughs> dry and bitter, but um, you can make jam with them. And um, I've watched birds just strip uh, the berries off of trees. These are very useful to attract wildlife. Um, and these are also easily grown from seed. As I mentioned, the uh, Gamble's oak is one of our common species here in Utah. Um, it is valuable in that it provides uh, huge areas of habitat. Uh, it protects the birds um, from predators because they got very dense covering. Um, the uh, birds frequently build nests up in the trees. They also provide habitat for deer and small mammals. Um, and of course, the acorns are a very uh, high nutrient source of food for multiple species of uh, animals. So Utah, of course, has uh, huge swaths of evergreen forests, um, and especially like up in the Uintas and the Wasatch and the LaSalle Mountains. Um, and during the winter months, evergreen trees are very valuable for providing cover to uh, many animal species. Uh, so we have two common species of pinion pines in Utah. We have Pinus edulis and Pinus monophylla. Um, I love uh, pinion pines because they have fragrant bark. Um, they're, they're, um, I love their shape. Uh, they're very drought tolerant. Um, they are easy to grow in the garden. And of course they produce these uh, uh, cones with edible nuts. And these nuts are uh, you know, tasty and they are a very important source of food for uh, many species of animals in Utah and Utah birds, uh, especially like pine jays and um, squirrels and other mammals. And uh, typically in September, they produce huge crops of these in some areas it, from year to year. So the white fir, of course, is our uh, what common foothill uh, evergreen. So these produce dense cover for wildlife. And of course they produce these cones at the top of the tree that kind of just fall apart and the seeds scatter, but they're an important uh, source of food uh, for wildlife. And of course we have the junipers. Uh, we have juniperus uh, occidentalis and then osteosperma. Uh, the occidentalis is the one that grows up in the mountains and the foothills. And of course the osteosperma is the one that grows all over the deserts. So they're very similar, uh, except for the, the occidentalis has the smaller berries, and then the osteosperma has the larger ones. 
But these uh, trees are important. In, uh, they form components of, uh, of the P&J communities throughout Utah. Um, they serve to provide food and habitat for multiple species. So <clears throat> sources for natives, uh, this has been a problem for a lot of us who, who really try to advocate for growing native plants is it, there aren't a lot of sources to go buy native plants. But um, locally we have, of course, Red Butte Garden, we have Mill Creek, we have Cactus and Tropicals, um, even Smith's Marketplace has natives. Um, we have Western Gardens, High Country Gardens, um, Granite Seed and Online Nurseries. So one of the easiest things I uh, like to do is in the fall, I, I like to collect acorns. Um, uh, I'll take the fruit off of the Ribes aureum or the elderberry, and I simply plant them in a one gallon pot with uh, native soil mixed in with some mulch. And I leave them out all winter and um, in the spring, I, I produce my own native plants. So that is the easiest way. You, uh, a lot of the plants that I highlighted in this talk can be grown this way. Um, they are very easy to grow. And if, if you water them a little bit more than you would uh, normally, they actually grow quickly. So you could uh, get a, quite a few plants within a couple of years and have a, a nice landscape that you uh, had grown from seed. So um, resources for, uh, Inf uh, information and inspiration include the Utah Native Plant Society, of course. Utah State University has great sources online. High Country Gardens um, has some information about species, how to grow them. Um, and of course, we have Jordan Valley Water District, the Avenues Conservancy Garden. Um, I like to go up to Red Butte Garden to get inspiration uh, and see what species are highlighted. And um, of course, the best inspiration is nature itself. I, I love to go out, hike around. Um, see what's blooming, uh, but nature is my biggest source of inspiration. So, and then some, for some of you who are looking for some books, um, I like the Native Plants for High Elevation Gardens, uh, Western Gardens. Um, and then there's the Waterwise Native Plants for Intermountain Landscapes. We also have the Cutting Edge Gardening in the Intermountain West, and then Landscaping on the New Frontier. So Waterwise Design for the Intermountain West by Susan Meyer et al. But these are these books are, are wonderful. They're they're designed specifically for our area. So um, I highly re recommend if you are interested in starting a garden to get these in your library. So <clears throat> with that, there there are also other meaningful ways we can help our wildlife and our plant life. Um, you know, planting a native landscape is just one part, but we can also make meaningful choices by simply by choosing the way we shop, how we eat. Um, you know, using public transportation um, by, you know, biking or driving only when necessary. Recycling, I think, is important. Um, keeping your cats indoors. We don't, we, we all don't realize that um, cats are, you know, if you're trying to attract urban wildlife, you don't want to have a cat running in the garden eating everything. Um, they kill 2 billion year, uh, birds a year and 12 billion mammals annually. So they are actually a big problem in our urban landscapes. Um, living in smaller environmentally friendly homes that minimize resource usage, um, planting gardens and growing your own food is, is, is a big uh, thing that everybody can do to help um, the planet. And then the biggest thing I, I recommend is going and voting. Um, contact your local elected officials, advocate for change, demand changes in zoning laws. Like right now being in a, a huge drought, I think you know, maybe contacting our legislator and demanding, you know, native plants be used in landscapes and, and lawns be done away with. I think that is, these are things that all of us can do just by simply spending 20 minutes e emailing our, our local representatives, but really getting a, a voice to, uh, of change. Um, we really need to, to start, uh, especially with Salt Lake City, the way it's growing, it's becoming compact and stuff. We're losing green space. And I think if each of us hits up our local um, politicians, we can really um, advocate for change. So, and with that, I want to thank everyone for attending.